Hey, Justin here with Stay at Home Dads Podcast. Welcome to the place I talk about a lot of dad stuff, as well as a lot of guy stuff, parenting stuff, you know, all the things you may think about. I sit here and I attempt to talk about them. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. I really do appreciate it. So I hope everyone had a great week. I've been on, or actually just got done with, some solo dad duty. My wife went out of town for some work training. She went somewhere on the East Coast. What was it? D.C. or Maryland or Delaware or something. But she went out there for some work training. So I had the kids for the whole week to myself. And that can always be an interesting situation. But we managed. We got it handled. And they did pretty well. I also made a nice week-long meal plan. So I could shop and get all the stuff for the week, and not really worry about what in the hell I'm going to cook. And that helped out big time. My wife actually bought these recipe boxes off of Amazon, and they have a week's worth of recipes, like low-calorie or or healthy recipes in there, and you can pull a card out, and it'll have a whole shopping list for the whole week for all the recipes on there. And then it'll have individual cards in there for each day, so you can pull that out and cook whatever you need. And it it helped out a lot, actually. It took all that annoying guesswork and stress out of scrambling around trying to figure out what in the hell I'm going to whip up for dinner every night, especially being alone. So it it really helped out. I think they were called Passionate Penny Pinchers or something like that, something she found on Amazon. But I'll link it in the description so you can check it out. And they have a lot of different food in there. Some of it the kids aren't going to like, but you can kind of pick and choose, and that's what I did. And found some things that I figured they would eat. So it was kind of cool. All right, moving on. So I'm starting to realize that I am getting old. I know I'm 40. That's not really old, old or anything. But I just saw this guy on social media and he was talking about how he realized he's getting old with the things he has started to like to do. Going to Home Depot because he enjoyed the smell of wood and uh, clipping coupons to save 80 cents. And it kind of makes you laugh, right? You're probably laughing, being like, well, that's not that serious or whatever. But the funny thing is, is that I can relate with him. It's true. Like, I I enjoy saving money, probably more now than I did when I was younger. I search coupons. I search through the store app, clipped little coupons on the Kroger app, and I do all that crap. Sometimes I enjoy the casual trip to Home Depot, too perusing the aisles and checking out the shiplap to put in my house or the different kind of garage lights I want to put up or even cruising the classifieds in the paper like the nifty nickel or something like who who does that anymore but I guess I do and I also enjoy a quiet evening in just hanging out at home have a drink hanging out with my wife sitting by my fire in the backyard instead of going out to a club or a bar or going out a ton I just my, my focus has clearly shifted, and I'm also enjoying planting shit, like plants in my yard. I usually hate planting plants. I don't, I don't know what's happening. And all these things are just a couple of things that I've noticed in things I like to do or I enjoy to do. I mean, of course, there's a bunch of other things with my body and how I feel and how my knees feel or how my back feels or the fact that I can't sneak up on my kids or my wife anymore without my joints popping damn near scares him. Or if I sleep wrong one night, my neck hurts so bad, I feel like I was in a severe car crash or something. Or sitting on the floor for over an hour, you know, doing Legos with my kids, like I talked about a few weeks ago. And then when I go to get up, I can barely get off the floor because I'm so stiff and sore. So can anyone else relate with this stuff? I can't be alone, right? It sucks, doesn't it? My body is getting old and hurting, and my mind feels like it's 22 still. And apparently, the things I find joyful in life are going to Home Depot, looking at plants, and clipping coupons. Oh my gosh, this sounds serious, guys. Well, now I guess I'm getting old enough that even AARP articles are appealing to me for some weird reason for some light reading. Yes, yes, AARP. What in the... I don't... I don't know. I know they're for like 50 plusers or retired people, but it still caught my eye. And I don't know what is happening to me, but this is where I'm headed apparently. And the article that I saw, I happened to see, I wasn't really looking for it. It just popped up as I was scrolling through Apple News Spotlight on my phone or whatever the deal is on there. But it was called Five Good Habits That Might Be Causing Premature Aging. And while it kind of intrigued me a little bit, I'm getting older, like I said, I'm feeling 
the burn, so to speak, and aging is inevitable. My skin's not going to get any tighter. My eyesight's not going to get any better. So anything I can change now or do differently will hopefully help that aspect. If it's good for us at 50 or 60, then it must be great at 40 is what I'm going to assume. Plus good habits. I mean, the article says five good habits. So what good habits can we change? Maybe we're doing something wrong here. So, all right, first off, this article was written by Leslie Goldman at AARP. So she says that we all get into habits, day in, day out habits, things we do to better our health, to better our lifestyle. And those things are great, but even healthy habits can benefit from a little shakeup. And we're probably missing out on other things or other activities that we could do that would offer a wider array of benefits. So they talked to a bunch of experts in medicine and nutrition about some healthy habits that they wished people would take breaks from or change if you want to keep yourself in top operating form. So, all right, habit number one, walking every day for exercise. Leslie says walking is great. It's good. Don't stop walking and people should actually walk more. It helps maintain your strength of your heart, your joints. But as we age, people tend to only focus on one type of exercise or strenuous activity. And what's that one type of exercise usually? Walking, because that's what people do. Why? Well, because as we get older, we tend to fear things that could hurt us, essentially. Thinking you're getting too old for other activities like running or weight training or playing some sport, I guess. Claire Morrow, a physical therapist from Hinge Health, says don't let that fear stick you in a rut. Your body is made to move, and that doesn't diminish as you get older. She actually said as we age, our muscle mass and joint mobility loss accelerates. And without strength training, the average person will lose between 3 and 8% of their muscle mass per decade. And that's after age 30 is when that starts. That's kind of crazy. And muscle loss is associated with increased fall risk, cognitive decline, and increased risk of dementia. I did not know that. So get into the gym, I guess. And see, reading an AARP article is beneficial. Because if that stuff starts happening at 30, I'm 40, so I could benefit from what I'm currently doing. So I'm glad that I am exercising and working out and getting some cardio. Anyways, so they say get an exercise routine that includes an array of different activities that include your walking, but also some form of strength training to tax your muscles and build endurance. The CDC recommends at least 150 minutes of moderate to intense activity a week, as well as at least two days of some form of strength training. Weights or body weight exercising, all that stuff is good. And if you've listened to me before, hopefully you have, then you know that I promote health and physical activity and getting out there, lifting some weights. I go to the gym five days a week, sometimes six. Just get out there and do something physical. Yes, the walking's good, but you need to do more than that. As we age, we need to do more than that. We don't want to lose that muscle and become frail little people. So if you have a home gym, then great, use it. Or you can get a membership like I do. I actually get mine through my health insurance, so I actually pay a discounted rate. So make sure you check with your health insurance for something similar. I imagine a lot of health insurance plans come with it because they want to promote you being healthy, and being healthy comes with a, a gym membership. I think mine even shows nutrition stuff, training stuff, a bunch of different things that I haven't even gotten into yet, but it's kind of interesting. I should check it out myself. And like I said, walking is great. Don't stop doing that. Don't stop going for your daily walks with your, with your buddies or your dog or your girlfriends or whatever. And it's normal to be scared of injury, especially when you start lifting weights. I've talked about it on here before with knee pains and, and bicep pain and shoulder pain and, and all that stuff. It's kind of scary to injure yourself. But that doesn't mean you have to go crazy or heavy at the gym. You're not trying to be some 40-year-old super Arnold bodybuilder. I think a lot of people, especially as they age, they put a ton of emphasis on cardio, 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 that walking, that doing the elliptical, whatever. But if we don't tax our muscles on a regular basis, then we're going to continue to get weaker and increase that fall risk and be less stable like Leslie was talking about. And if you think about it, that's what happens to a lot of our older relatives, our older family members. It's, it's really sad. It's really sad that it happens, but... They, you know, I mean, you get older, you're going to get weaker and you're not going to be able to go to a gym and do strength training. But I think if we start on that stuff early and try to do the best we can with it, 
then that will reduce that risk. I mean, we all know family members, like I just said, that have had a spill or had a fall, and it's really it's really taken a lot out of them, and things go south. It's it's sad, but it's true. It's it's something that um, don't let that get away from you. Plus, for us that aren't 50 yet or older, who still want to get out and play with our kids and play some soccer, kick a ball, or run around with them, or be on the floor with them like I talked about, getting into strength training as well as your walking will help with all that. I know it's hard for me to get off the floor sometimes still, and I'm doing all the strength training, but I know it's better than if I wasn't doing it at all. All right, habit number two, constantly wearing supportive shoes. Now, I just actually went to, well, I guess it's been quite a few months, seven, eight, nine months, but I went to physical therapy, and they actually put insoles in my shoes. So I was actually kind of interested to read this habit. And actually, I follow quite a few body mobility pages and exercise pages on Instagram and social media, and they kind of talk about how traditional shoes don't allow for the proper foot, what's the word, placement or function, and... A lot of shoes, today's shoes, actually squish your feet, mainly your toes, not allowing them to spread out and have that proper room to do what they're supposed to do. So habit two says most older adults wear shoes all day long thinking that this will give them more support and help their feet. But podiatrist Emily Spleichel says constantly encasing your feet in shoes will progressively weaken them by not allowing them to work and function as they should. The supportive shoe or insole does most of the work that your foot and toes should be doing. She also said that the bottoms of our feet have thousands of nerves that send information to the brain that helps us with proper posture and balance. And these cushy soles and these shoes rob our feet of that sensory stimulation. So she said when we can, we should go barefoot for at least 30 minutes a day, especially when we're on our feet and our movement is varied. This will promote that nerve stimulation that we're looking for. Also, when buying shoes, we need to make sure that the toe area is wide enough for our feet. That's a lot of what those Instagram pages were telling me anyways, that shoes that squish the toes together are not good at all. And actually, one way to check this is when buying shoes is take the insole out of the shoe, the liner, and then put it on the floor and then put your foot on it and see how your foot fits on that liner. And that will give you a great indication how your foot will fit inside the shoe or how wide or narrow the shoe actually is. So if your foot and your toes fit on the inside of that shoe liner, then that's good. But now if you put your foot on it and your toes are hanging off, then that's bad, and those shoes are actually too narrow for your foot. In which, yes, dress shoes, a lot of dress shoes for men and women, a lot of the fancy shoes for women are crazy narrow. You see how they smash their toes. It's pretty crazy. It's probably hard to get around those types of shoes. But at least for sneakers or running shoes or daily shoes, This would be a good thing to kind of practice. I definitely would recommend making sure that they're wide enough. You can even kind of do some searching around online and see how wide toes should be or how spread out toes can be and what narrow shoes are actually doing to people's feet. I mean, you hear about bunions and stuff like that on a lot of people, and that's really from really narrow shoes. They call it a toe box, and if the toe box is really narrow, then it's really bad for your feet. And the only reason is fashion. That's what they say anyways. I actually want to get a pair of those like running minimus shoes where you actually put your toes in individual things. They look kind of weird and freaky, but I kind of want to try them out. All right, habit number three, you drink water when you're thirsty. You're probably thinking, well, that doesn't even make any sense. Well, it's not the water that's the problem. It's the thirst aspect of it. By the time you actually feel thirsty or get thirsty, you're probably already dehydrated, they say. They say our body's internal mechanism for triggering a sensation of thirst becomes less sensitive as we age. And actually about 70% of adults above 51 are chronically underhydrated, according to epidemiologist Jody Stuckey. Muscles hold more water than fat. And if you remember habit number one, we lose muscle, then we also lose our ability to store water. And granted, I think this is stuff for much older people that should be reading AARP but I think it could still play a factor in us, you know, 30 and 40 year old people. They also say chronic dehydration can put us at greater risk for UTIs as well as increased risk of diabetes, colon, and bladder cancer. So, which I think everything causes cancer these days. 
Integrative internist Dana Cohen says that we've trained ourselves not to be thirsty because we don't want to be going to the bathroom so much, especially when it gets towards the evening when we're going to bed. She recommends drinking enough water so you feel the need to pee every two to three hours. She also said we can eat more water, which sounds weird, but plants and fruits are loaded with fiber and water that help keep that water inside our body much longer, and the minerals help the water penetrate the body cells. This is actually something I don't put a lot of thought into, and I imagine a lot of people don't put a lot of thought into it. I drink maybe a few cups of coffee in the morning, then I'll have a protein shake somewhere in there, maybe a diet soda, or maybe some water with that flavor stuff in it, maybe a small glass of water at dinner. And I think in the summertime when we're hot and we're sweaty, it's easy to drink a bunch of water, but I've really noticed my water intake goes down in the wintertime when I'm not sweating that much. I'm not really going outside and doing a ton of stuff because it's freezing cold. So maybe I should really think about my water intake a little bit more, I guess. All right, habit number four, you stay out of the sun. From kids in school all day, being inside, and then getting home from school, and probably a lot of kids being on devices and being indoors, and people working in offices all day long, the older retired people staying in on the couch all day, this one just doesn't affect a certain subset of people. It really does affect all of us. Not many of us get enough sun. Sarah Mendick is a professor of cognitive science. She says that sun coming up in the morning and entering your eyes tells your brain it's time to start that day, that early morning sun. This actually has a domino effect throughout the day, cueing your body to feel awake and energized for the day, and then regulating your appetite, your mood, and then as that sun sets at night, its orange hues get into your eyes again, triggering your circadian clock to release sleep-promoting hormones, and then sleep. Muscles repaired, energy replenished, and your brain is cleaned of toxic byproducts that build up during the day. So getting that sunlight in your eyes, especially in the morning and in the evening, is super important. She says the average person in their 50s, granted we're not 50, or I'm not 50 anyways, they spend less than an hour a day in sunlight. At minimum, she says, we should go outside for 15 to 30 minutes in the morning, and then again in the late afternoon to take in those calming sunsets. Have that glass of wine, have that glass of water, maybe, because we're not drinking enough. Go sit on the back patio or sit on the front porch, watch the sun go down, get that nice orange sun in your eyes. This will give your circadian rhythm the push that it needs to help you really regulate your sleep. And I've heard this before, I've heard this a lot on more social media pages, and I've been really trying to implement this in my daily routine as well. I actually follow this guy on Instagram called Andrew Huberman. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. But he promotes getting the sunlight into your eyes as early as you can in the morning. As soon as the sun comes up, primarily within that first hour of waking, he calls it low solar angle sunlight and get 10 to 30 minutes of that to improve your mood and help you set your circadian clock, making you alert and awake during the day. Just like Sarah said, that's what Andrew says as well. He also talks about and promotes midday sun, which he calls the circadian dead zone. And this is sun that doesn't really help you with your circadian clock and there's no yellow or blue contrast in the sky to help with that waking and sleeping he said this sunlight is good for hormone production as well as giving you a better mood essentially so there are benefits across the board here just don't get sunburn and don't look directly into the sun he also said don't wear sunglasses but don't look directly into the sun so you want to get those light rays in the early morning into your face into your eyes but don't burn your freaking retinas out but yeah, go out there and give that morning sun a little try. See if it makes a difference with your day, your mood, and even your sleep habits. And both Mendick and Huberman say not to look at screens or phones before bed. We always, I always talk about that all the time. That's bad. It's a tough habit to break, but try to turn them off an hour or two before going to bed. In my opinion, try to even limit it. Not even get rid of it completely, because I know that's impossible for everyone, but we can limit it to a certain extent. All right, habit number five. We're almost done, I promise. You eat nutrition bars. And this one sounds kind of silly because I read it. I was like, really? This is a tip? But anyways, according to medical doctor Rajani Kata, some doctor, I don't know, she says they may sound like a wise choice, just like the healthy fruit juices, quote unquote healthy, smoothies or other, you know, good for you breakfast cereals. But in most cases, they're just cleverly marketed sugary foods that pose as health foods. So they're fake. She says they're just disguised as a healthy alternative to a candy bar, pretty much, and they can actually have more sugar than you should really have in an entire day in one 
bar, which this has always irritated me a lot, shopping and seeing commercials and looking at stuff, this marketing stuff. The fact that these companies call things healthy or market them in such a way where people think they're doing something good for themselves when in reality they aren't. Also, people don't typically take the time to read a freaking label either. They just see some stupid buzzword or hit word like healthy or light or low fat or whatever, and they automatically think that they're doing the right thing or choosing the right thing. Take Skinny Pop, for example. I know I've mentioned this probably on some other episodes, but looking at the label, Skinny Pop and Doritos, they both have the same serving size, 28 grams. Skinny Pop has 10 grams of fat, 15 grams of carbs, 3 grams of fiber, and 2 grams of protein. Now take the Doritos, which you're going to assume is going to be super awful and way worse than Skinny Pop, right? Sounds way worse. Well, the Doritos have 8 grams of fat, 18 grams of carbs, 1 gram of fiber, and also 2 grams of protein in the same serving size, 28 grams. So not really much of a difference, is there? Yes, the ingredients are different. I think the Skinny Pop has very basic ingredients, but people really just see that buzzword of skinny in Skinny Pop and they assume, oh, it's leaps and bounds better for you than chips, and it's a lie. This all just kind of goes to having a good diet, and when I say diet, I don't mean diet like restrictive diet. Maybe it should be called educated food intake or educated food choices instead of diet because diet seems to have bad connotation. But let me get back on track here. According to this article in Katata, they say that more sugar means faster aging. Excess levels of sugar in the blood can combine with proteins to create a compound called advanced glycation end products. I don't really know what that means, but they stiffen blood vessels and organs in the process. This causes something called sugar sag is what they mention here. Consuming too much sugar can accelerate collagen damage and lead to wrinkly, saggy, skin. So sugar is not good for your skin. I did not know that either. I have no idea what glycation is, but it makes me want to watch my sugar intake, I guess. So if you eat a lot of sugar or sodas or whatnot, you may want to just try and limit those or rethink those choices. Maybe switch to an artificial sweetener, but also keep the artificial sweeteners low too. I've kind of read some things that excessive Sweeteners aren't great for you either, but that's a topic for another day. So basically, read the labels on stuff you eat. Try to steer clear of ultra-processed foods. Think of how stores are laid out. You ever think about how a grocery store is laid out? The outer edges are typically the fresh foods, the fresh breads, the meat department, then you have the dairy and the eggs and the cheese, and you kind of come around to the frozen, right? The inner aisles are usually where you find all the super ultra processed garbage. So just try to keep that in mind when you're perusing around the store. All right, one last one I want to talk about real quick, and it's not on this list, but we kind of mentioned it earlier, and that's sleep. Last week's episode was a very cringe-worthy Dad Classics episode on sleep tips. So if you hadn't heard that, hopefully you got some useful tips out of it. But anyways, really look at getting that good sleep. We always push getting enough sleep with our kids, and I know a lot of us are not getting the sleep that we need. And actually, a quick Google search indicates that even a single night of bad sleep can make older adults' cells age quicker. I don't know how true that is. I didn't really dive into that article, but that's what it says. And I know, too, that we all have more than just one night of bad sleep or one night of staying up late. It usually happens quite regularly. So... Put the kids to bed early, relax with your spouse for a little bit, get that quality spouse time, and then get your ass to bed at a decent time, get that seven hours of sleep that the Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends that you get, and don't forget to limit the phone screen. I know the TV is much harder to limit, but I think even the phone can be just put down or turned off for a while, and just limit that screen for a little bit. Maybe read a book, I don't know, but try to get better sleep, that's all I'm saying. All right, that's all I have for today's episode of Stay at Home Dad's Podcast. I hope I enlightened you a little bit. I hope I gave you a few good tips that maybe you didn't know about or think about. We can uh, we can all appreciate the old AARP article. So, anyways, 
good information, right? Hopefully. Now, if you have any tips on limiting how fast we get old, I would love to hear them. So please send me a message over on social media, at Vegas Raymer on Instagram, or on podbean.com. You can actually get all my episodes there, too. There's 70-some out there, so you can check all them out. If you would, you can follow me on there, you can like it on there, and you can share it from there, too. But either way, let me know what you think. Also, speaking of social media, I'm going to post the Skinny Pop and Doritos labels over there so you can kind of take a look at them side by side and and see what I'm talking about. It's kind of an interesting label read. Lastly, if you would, please share this show, share this podcast with friends and family. Help me grow this little show. I would appreciate that as well. And remember, you can get this podcast on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, as well as Spotify. And that's it. Thanks for listening, everyone, and I will talk to you next week.